If I were to tell you that Spider-Man 2 on the PS5 is not a masterpiece, would you think I'm insane and give me all 19 inches of venom? Or would you sit down and be like, wait a second, is this guy cooking? Or am I, am I, am I losing my mind? Spider-Man 2 on the PS5 is not a masterpiece. Miles Morales has a really good arc. Starfield still f***ing sucks. Cry Xbox fanboys. This video is going to be containing a lot of spoilers. Actually, that's not true. This video is containing every spoiler. If that's a problem, play the game. And if you can't afford the game, stop being poor. Buy a PS5. What's wrong with you? Still f***ing broke? You fucking loser. What's wrong? Get a f***ing job. Well, my bad. Uh, on a real note, though, this video will be spoiling the whole game and a bunch of the movies from here on out, so no more interruptions. Hey, Skipper. Hello. It's me, Mingus. It's great to be editing this video. Thank you so much for the copy. A lot of you here are new to the Dr. Skipper empire. Down here, we work like a dog, we get built like a horse, and we talk about the new Spider-Man video game at every transitional period of our life. Spider-Man PS4 up. is great. Shut Spider -Man the up. PS4. We are not high top films. We are 16 years old and skipped homecoming to play this game. The Insomniac Spider-Man games are something I hold dear to my heart. They are great immersive action superhero games where just like Batman, you don't kill bad guys. You just make them wish you did. Man, I'm dead. I've been here from the start. Puddlegate, nerdy white guy becoming a different nerdy white guy that made me very angry as a kid. But in all honesty, I kind of prefer the new one now. This is the best suit ever in Spider-Man history. How the hell do we let this slide? And why is it orange? Also, who the f*** did this kid dirty? Look at his hair. What is he, a, a nerd who plays Smash Bros or something? Uh, hey, Insomniac, do you got like any black employees with style? You cleaned them up, new fade. Oh shit, that's me. My bad, Insomniac. I wasn't familiar with your game. So, Insomniac, uh, did we fire all the black employees and give Connor from the mailroom their job? Because what the hell happened? I need an explanation and an apology. Don't ever cook again. In 2020, I played Miles Morales on my PS4 because I was a broke 18-year-old college student who was going to get a PS5 when pigs flew. And I really enjoyed it. But then a year later, we got the first trailer for Spider-Man 2 that had a little guy that you might know named Venom in it. Then at the end, it said it was coming out in 2023. So, I had two years to sit and rot in silence with my little... PS4 and I wasn't gonna get to play the game. A bunch of icebergs, blow up videos, bought the PS5, put a Jurassic Park rap on the PS5 because I'm a man child, played God of War Ragnarok, had it collect dust for a year until May 24th where we got a reveal. They had Crave the Hunter, Peter in a symbiote, the lizard. It was a lot. It's 2023, the game's out, I beat it, gave a quarter to the homeless so he could beat it too. Checkmate Pinkertons, now it's a tax write-off. So enough of the catch up. I'm Dr. Skipper. This is my channel. I play the game. And if you don't subscribe right now, I'm gonna f you little s kick your and family while we're at it too, you mother Spider-Man 2 was a game with colossal expectations. The first game was universally enjoyed. Miles Morales was seen as a good expansion, but not worth the price of a standalone game to some. Halo 3 ODST moment. And now to play Spider-Man 2 requires a PS5. PS4 ain't gonna cut it no more. Skill issue, to be honest. <laughs> we out here. And a $70 purchase. And with the $70 purchase, you get a 10-hour campaign and a more expanded New York City. Oh, okay. That's pretty expensive. In one lens, I don't really care about this game as a game. I bought it with the knowledge that I was gonna get a really good Spider-Man movie, so as long as the narrative is solid, I'm happy with my transaction. And on the other side, it's still a video game that is $70 and should be analyzed as such. For the story, I believe the video game format is the best way to adapt a Spider-Man story. And that Spider-Man 2 fixes a lot of flaws that were in Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3, as well as Mark Webb's Tasm 2. And for the game, I think there are some issues as well as some really disingenuous arguments and other stuff that is great. While Spider-Man could stop rhinos, scorpions, and poor people trying to fight the tide of a crippling economy, he can't beat a plane in, in World War II. Have you ever wanted to fly an F-14 jet because you saw Starscream kill a bunch of other jets in Michael Bay's Transformers when you were a kid? Well, you probably never will. <coughs> Not true, because you now can in War Thunder who is sponsoring today's video. War Thunder is a vehicle combat game where you get to live out all your Top Gun and Fury fantasies. It's a fast, immersive PvP experience that can provide you fun and constant action in many ways. Like I just said, I like to release my inner Tom Cruise and get in a bunch of dogfights with jets. But sometimes I also like to be my little tank where I release my inner Brad Pitt as I kill a bunch of other tanks with explosive shells. There's over 2,000 types of vehicle choices, ranging from tanks, helicopters, planes, even ships. You could be a vehicle from the 1920s as well as a modern day vehicle, where we use thrusters on jets now instead of 
spinning nose blades. Every vehicle in the game had care and thought put in when they were getting cooked in the lab, so that when you're in a dogfight mowing people down, you could take a second to appreciate that little weld mark on your favorite plane that you love so much, since the devs put in the legwork to be accurate. You also know what I love? When things are free. And you love that as well, so win-win because War Thunder is free to play on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation. And for new members and those who haven't touched the game for at least six months, can now claim a large bonus pack by using my link in the description. You don't want to miss out. The pack includes multiple premium vehicles, an exclusive 3D decorator for your vehicles, and it's available for limited time. So when it's gone, it's gone for good. Once again, it's a good game. It's free on all platforms. Click my link in the description and have fun shooting each other down. And look at that. Spider-Man crashed the plane. We're in an era where everyone online has a megaphone and is able to spew whatever the hell they want about what they want. And what some have decided to do with that megaphone is meet right corporations that don't give a shit about their existence. I have a PC. I have an Xbox. I have a Switch. These are all pieces of hardware with a motherboard that play games. But these pieces of hardware have games that are designed for them exclusively, which creates comparisons and competition. I have allegiance to no company. I have loyalty to no company. I just like video games. And Nintendo released Mario Wonder and The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom this year, and Sony has released Spider Spider-Man 2, and last year they had God of War Ragnarok, and Xbox has Starfield, and last year they had Redfall, and before that they had Halo Infinite. When Halo released it was a shit game, when Redfall released it was a shit game, Starfield is a shit game. If you're wondering if the kill gets easier, the answer is yes. 1.3 million of you know this from Moa himself. But how the cookie has crumbled, Xbox just has shit games. But Game Pass is still an amazing service, Xbox has a better UI than Sony, hell the user experience is better than PlayStation. They just have shit games. They just do. But when Starfield came out, some were ripping the game apart in unjustified ways because of Sony Allegiance, which was stupid. But everybody knows how bad PlayStation fanboys are. I bring all this up because Xbox fanboys are also just as terrible and disingenuous. I made a tweet that said, Xbox fans are just as bad if not worse than PlayStation ones. You don't hear about it though due to echo chambers of bigger YouTube validation biases. Starfield ain't game of the year, little bro, and Spider-Man 2 is most likely gonna clear. I also said this, Never trust the words of anyone whose entire foundations are built off of one thing entirely. They will always be biased and disingenuous. And this applies to games, television shows, movies, etc. How can you ever have a good perspective on something if that's all you consume? And I stand by this. The opinion of anyone who's dedicated to one side of something entirely is an opinion that should never matter. Consoles don't make bad games. The Last of Us 2 sucks because of Naughty Dog, not the PS5. Halo Infinite sucks because of 343, Redfall sucks because of Arcane, and Starfield sucks because of Bethesda not the Xbox. I didn't say Sony or Microsoft, I said the Xbox and the PS5. They are just hardware. And I state all of this because I pointed out how Starfield was a terrible game with comparisons to Bethesda's older work, their better work, games I've also criticized, games that do things better. Overall, I made cohesive and fair arguments. I didn't break the game intentionally, I didn't critique Microsoft's hardware and their inputs, I critiqued Bethesda because it was their game. Insomniac has good faith from me because of all these titles. They haven't dropped the ball yet. I like Spider-Man 2. I like it more than Starfield. Spider-Man 2 is not a bad game, but it has flaws and problems that I want to talk about. And unlike these sheep-ass idiots on Twitter, I will be fair and honest and point out real problems that aren't moronic and in bad faith. And if you have allegiance to any company that is designed to make money off you, I think you suck and I flat out don't care about what you have to say. I am better than you. It is what it is. Cry to the bank. So when looking at Spider-Man 2 as a game, you need to first acknowledge what it is. It's a Spider-Man superhero action game that takes place in New York City, which means traversal and combat are going to be the main ways to play in this movie-like experience that is designed specifically to be a fun Disneyland attraction, or in this case, a fun Coney Island attraction. But instead of local crackheads, we have Drake-ass dialogue. I needed this. Well, Look at Dodger. This isn't an open world role playing game. You don't need to go in every bodega or the subway meeting Master Splinter. You're just supposed to swing around and beat up bad guys. And in my Starfield video, I discussed what makes a good attraction in video games. And the main components are immersion and reactivity, which Spider Man 2 nails down. New York in this game isn't realistic. There's no side talk Spider Man yapping about the Knicks. Troy Young looks like my dad's dick! I, didn't, I never saw my dad's dick! <laughs> or rampant glizzy appearances. Fucking glizzy bit me, yo! Me too. Oh. Fucking glizzy. 
I didn't see Ice Spice shake ass in the deli once. But other than that, New York is alive and thriving. It's populated, reactive, and not dead on the inside like a certain game that I'm not fond of. On the fidelity mode, you could go anywhere and see loads of people and traffic. It makes me cry tears of joy that I don't live in New York because holy shit, does this look obnoxious. I don't know why I wrote this in the script. I have to live in New York. Get me the f out of here. There's two ways to play the game. As I mentioned, you have the fidelity mode as well as the performance mode. The fidelity mode drops the game to 30 FPS for stability while having all the settings cranked up to the max. This even includes the New York rats and roaches. Everything has ray tracing and tons of details in the fidelity mode. And then on performance mode, you go to 60 FPS. Those New York rats are now pixelated, but smooth like butter. <laughs> butter rats. It's nice that you have these two options. I play the game on both settings, and at some point I preferred graphics over the gameplay because of what the game is. I don't mind the 30 FPS since the game is fast motion. My skin wasn't melting like when I played Bloodborne. And it was worth the trade-off for the amazing face models and attention to detail in this New York City. This ain't Starfield, fellas. Face models are clean and reactive. People don't don't act like Daredevil, this is a Spider-Man game, and Immersion is here for you. So with this pretty ass game, how is traversal in combat? Traversal in this game is spectacular, so spectacular that it makes me not want to play the two previous ones ever again, aside from the stories, Christmas aesthetic, and Miles Morales that doesn't look like it was designed by Connor from the mailroom. Why the f do you still have a job? Jesus Christ, take him back to the shed and smoke this f***ing guy. It's like when a game adds a grapple hook. Adding convenient tools to a sandbox changes how that sandbox works entirely. Spider-Man 2 is really similar to Tears of the Kingdom in that way. On the surface, you have the same game as before, but with entirely different mechanics in the same area that changes how the game functions. Insomniac took notes from what people wanted. The fun of web swinging is momentum and speed. Speed. I am speed. Faster than fast. I glide like... <laughs> vector from Despicable Me. And since you now have Queens and Brooklyn to explore other than just Manhattan, it makes sense that Insomniac implemented more ways to get around faster. You could slingshot into momentum like an angry bird, do a loop-de-loop -loop into a glide into the wind drafts to then use abilities for even more momentum. Miles was able to do this with Venom abilities in his game, but now Peter can do this as well with his built-in arms or symbiote. So now they both have ways to speed around. It's a quality of life change that makes it the superior game to play out of the three if your main goal is to therapeutically swing for hours. Or do a TikTok live to people with ADHD to a, a Joji song or something. And with combat, they made some risky changes that some don't enjoy, but I really prefer. In Spider-Man 2018, you had tons of gadgets, too many gadgets. And these gadgets turned a lot of combat sections to click button to win scenarios. In Spider-Man 2018, Shut it makes up. sense that Peter uses Shut gadgets to gain having eight years of experience. You could spam all your gadgets and the fight was over. But in Miles Morales, Spider-Man no longer had these gadgets. But instead, combat abilities due to his Venom mechanic. It made you stay more in the fight with more variety than just dodging and spamming taser drones. It made combat more interactive, which made it more fun. Peter in 2018 was very vanilla, hold square and circle. But in Spider-Man 2, he now has way more options. He has robot arms that can have three abilities like Miles. And when he gets the symbiote, he also gets three abilities related to the symbiote. Him and Miles both get a parry so that you could counter fight instead of over relying on dodging. And like how Miles had a build up meter for an ultimate move, Peter now has the same thing for the symbiote. By doing this, you make Peter really fun, but you also alienate a lot of the customization in this game. Suits in 2018 had ultimate abilities that were unique to each suit that you would unlock. It added incentive to unlock them so that you could get their unique abilities. But with how Spider-Man 2 is designed, there's no reason to get suits since the progression system is designed in a very different way. You need to upgrade two Spider-Men, as well as their collaborative tree, as well as your basic mechanics and your gadgets. So why the hell would you waste resources on suits that have no purpose besides the four that you might want to use for pure aesthetic? There's way too many things to upgrade. So getting all the cosmetics are going to be the least of your priority. In 2018, your speed, damage, and health upgraded as you leveled up. They should have kept the system in place, reducing all the spinning plates that you have to juggle when it comes to upgrading things. Also, Insomniac removed a lot of suits from the first game while selecting only some to come back. The comic book suit is gone, Peter B. Parker is gone, all these guys are gone, but we got Tasm too, and we didn't need to cry about it for a year like the Toby suit in the first game. To make upgrades to things, you need to get tokens, and you get these tokens by doing stuff in the open world. After playing a lot of games this year, one of them being the Phantom Liberty DLC for Cyberpunk, I could say that I have played and enjoyed a lot of good side content. And Insomniac has some side missions that were really good and some that are really bland and repetitive. The ones I enjoyed are those that were impactful and assisted the theme of the Spider-Man game. Like Peter reflecting on his time as a photographer. Still a f***ing nerd by the way, but he can throw hands at least. Or these two really sad missions that I'll talk about later. And for other side missions, we have whole conflicts tied to new characters that feel like mini DLCs. Like there's a subplot with Wraith, the Flame Colt, and Carnage of all people. You have a side plot with Miles about who stole a bunch of instruments, and then you have a side 
side mission where you paint as Miles' deaf love interest covering up graffiti, and one where you help a kid with a homecoming proposal. I have no problem that they're gay, by the way, but some of the zest fest ass dialogue really made me consider swapping to Spider Man Lotus. The great electric spider. Some of these side missions have cool narratives and cliffhangers, but some of the actual content within them is repetitive and outdated, and there's way too many of them. Chameleon is revealed, but to get that reveal, you have to follow a bunch of Craven drones. Prowler gets an apartment and moves on from his past and teaches Miles a lesson, and to get this cutscene, you have to look for stuff and swing a door open over and over again. Sandman was being hunted by Craven and left behind shards of himself to tell a story, and the actual content is clear an area and press triangle. Pity. The Spider-Verse one is neat, it's like Peter's backpacks in the first game. Get a bunch of unique spider drones and then you get a cutscene. I'm okay with one simple thing, but all the other stuff, it's boring. We already have repetitive shit, like taking down Venom Nest, Craven Outpost, and general photography to get upgrade points. The side content with actual narrative purpose could have used actual mission design to them, than just repeated objectives. It's annoyingly safe for a $70 game three years after Miles Morales and five years after Spider-Man PS4. These missions aren't difficult or interesting, but rather monotonous and boring. Like, why are we still doing puzzles and using drones for environmental side missions? They weren't good in the first game, and they were not improved in this one. Yeah, Peter gets to ride a bike. Awesome. It's still more traversal than Starfield, but... You get the point. Something also that annoys me is the missing content from this game. I got on Halo Infinite's case about it, and Spider-Man is no different. This is a AAA PlayStation blockbuster. New Game Plus and replayable missions should have been here at launch. No excuses. And removing old features from the first game makes no sense to me. In Spider-Man 2018, you were able to change the day cycles for when you wanted to swing. With how good the fidelity mode is and traversal is in this game, it's incredibly disappointing that when you beat the game, you could only swing in midday sunny New York. And as of right now, we have no way of changing that. Same sentiment when it also comes to the symbiote suit. When you use a symbiote suit and anti-venom abilities, they are still white. It's a small fix, but why is it here anyway? It looks jarring and you already have it automatically set that when you swing its black webs, you even added attention to detail to the Raimi suit that shoots white webs, just like the movie. It just seems like a dumb oversight. To be fair, they also did get the Puerto Rican flag mixed with the Cuban flag. It's not game breaking, but it just should have been caught during obvious check sweeps. Also, the game does have some bugs, not as bad as like cyber punk or anything. I just thought I should bring that up. There's some visual glitches, some things that are weird. You could swing as a fucking cube for a long time. It's not like what people are saying on Twitter though. This game isn't bug filled and unenjoyable. It's most likely going to be fixed really soon, if not already when this video is published. Somniac referred to Spider-Man 2018 and Miles Morales as their Iron Man. That being a very strong start that's going to kick off a bunch of other great things in the Insomniac Marvel world. They already announced a Wolverine game, so the cogs are already in motion. So the Iron Man comparison is true. Spider-Man 2018 was an amazing game, and for Spider-Man Miles Morales, I compared it to Spider-Man Homecoming. It was a really good enclosed story about a fresh new Spidey learning the ropes and having to step up when his mentor is not available. And for Spider-Man 2, it's outdated and overrated and has no guts. I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3 is 2 hours and 19 minutes. And the main story for Spider-Man 2 is going to run you about 15 hours. And by doing basic math, that's like 8 Spider-Man 3s in 1. That's the advantage you get by being a video game or a TV show. You have the privilege of time to expand plot lines, characters, and the development of those characters and plot lines while also being able to have some fun at the same time. This is why so many people love the spectacular Spider-Man TV show so much. Spider-Man 3 and The Amazing Spider-Man 2 are spinning multiple plates in a small window of time, making it hard to focus and flesh out individual people or ideas. But when you have a lot of time and you still don't hit the nail on the head, it hurts 10 times more. And some stuff in this game just doesn't sit well with me. But let's talk about what this game does well first. The surface values of Spider-Man 2 had me thinking a lot. One of those being the fear of running out of time. Death creeping in glooms over the whole game. And it's a sad thing that everyone has dealt with or is gonna deal with in their life. If not yourself running out of time, then someone around you. And having to process a ticking clock on a person, it's a feeling that's heartbreaking and miserable, especially when it's out of your control or anyone's control, and it's just unfair. The two antagonists of the game, Harry and Craven, both are in situations where they are running out of time. Harry has a genetic disease that killed his mom and is now killing him, and Craven has stage four terminal cancer that will also kill him soon. And the responses from both of them 
or to find a way to cheat this ticking clock, even if it means harming others in the process. Harry's father has him wear an alien symbiote that ends with nothing but chaos, harm, and destruction, and has him still dying by the end of the game anyway, and Craven refuses to let his body decide when it's time to go, and seeks out someone worthy enough to kill him, even if it means pushing everyone away in his life, and stealing others of their life for his selfish, prideful desire. These two villains refuse to accept their horrible situations for what they are, and would rather use alternative ways to escape reality. Earlier I briefly mentioned two side missions, and in these side missions you talk to Grandpa Earl and a man named Howard. Earl and Howard are the opposite of Harry and Craven, and doing their side missions shows the contrast of finding peace and solace out of horrible circumstances, rather than giving in to the sadness and chaos. Grandpa Earl is on a path of nostalgia, and his granddaughter is looking for him, and when you find him, he talks about why he wandered to the spot that he wandered to, and it's because he was remembering his wife. I proposed to my wife here. Never met a soul who loved animals more than that woman. You ever been in love, Spider-Man? I know I'm fading. It's scary as hell. And when you find Howard, he also talks about why he needs you, and reflects on his life. I worked in that factory for 20 years. Made off. Lost my purpose for a while. And then when my wife passed, lost my heart too. But my birds, they taught me how to fly again. In both situations, these are two people who have been unfairly wronged by life, and now they are both fading. For Grandpa Earl, there's something so sad about him just coming to terms with what's happening. Even though his wife's gone and he's slowly fading, he still has a granddaughter who loves him, so he's gonna let life play out for her. And for Howard, a man who lost everything, turned to a life of peace and found purpose in nature through his pigeons. And his last request is to let the things that saved him be free. And when you get back after doing his last selfless request, it's revealed that Howard passed away in peace. Unlike Harry and Craven, these two didn't cheat their ticking clock. They both lost and suffered, but instead of feeding into that pain, they focus on the good rather than the bad. Howard set the flock free, and Earl is still with his granddaughter, and will continue to look back at how amazing his wife was. Stuff like this reminds me of how important media can be sometimes, because you could use any medium in its characters to tackle real world shit. Death is a thing that surrounds us all the time, and one of you watching this might be dying yourself, as morbid as that sounds, and death is scary and a train wreck, but even in death, you still have the choice to be a good person. Showing the two sides of this coin through characters is what made it really have an impact on me, and it's what made these two villains really stand out to me. This death predicament is really solid ground for the antagonist. It also fixes what I didn't like about Mark Webb's Green Goblin. The solution to Harry's disease in that movie is spider blood, and Harry goes, please, I'm dying, please let me have your blood, and Spider-Man goes, nah, which makes Spider-Man look like an asshole, and then Harry flips over a table and says one of the best lines in any Spider-Man movie. You're a fraud! I'm Spider-Man! Jokes aside, yeah, it's a horribly forced way to make Harry an antagonist. And in the Raimi trilogy, Harry becomes New Goblin, which is also pretty stupid since at the end of Spider-Man 2, he learns that his father was the Green Goblin, then he bunks his head, and Peter kills him. Insomniac Harry works the best. Harry Osborn is dying, and his dad is desperate, so he got Dr. Connors to scout out an unstable, unpredictable, out-of-this-world substance. And then he selfishly hoards it for his son. Now you have a clean introduction for the symbiote suit, and Venom exists with Spider-Man other than luck, and you have a clear reason for Harry Osborn to be Venom. Rather than evil Peter Parker getting black goo to be mean. Uh, this isn't a shot, by the way. I, I like Eddie Brock. I also pray in the downfall of my enemies. You know how someone who has no choice but to be codependent on the symbiote, which can create more tension with the character characters, and the plot. Without the symbiote, he's weak. Without the symbiote, he's left out. Without the symbiote, he can't live. And while this development plays out, you have Craven. Craven is a really good subversion of expectation. At first, you assume he's gonna want to hunt the little spiders that went up the water spout for the sake of being evil. Also, uh, everyone watching this video, don't kill spiders. They're good for nature. They're nature's vacuum. Even Peter assumes that Craven wants to kill them since his hunters were breaking bad guys out of jail. But then you find out Craven isn't making another Sinister Six, but rather just murking supervillains. <laughs> okay, poor Rhino, but God, this is so f funny. But he's not killing them in a malicious serial killer way, but rather a smart, strategic, and personally non personal way. Craven doesn't care about the history or who is praised. He instead works in a objective sense. He wants an equal rival to best him. He values strength, resilience, and other attributes in the philosophy of his hunt, which rivals a strong theme of this game, that being forgiveness and moving past your past. A lot of Craven's prey are ex villains that are moving forward from the criminal world. He isn't killing bad guys for the good of New York. Like I said, Craven works in a objective manner. 
He wants these guys to try and kill him, and this creates conflict for Peter and Miles, who believe that anybody could be redeemed and have a second chance. It's why Miles Morales has such a great character arc in this game. I've seen a lot of critiques for Miles, the most popular one coming from Cosmonaut Variety Hour. The same guy who said that Joel isn't a beloved character, and then compared him to Winnie the Pooh. Joel is not a f beloved character. Winnie the Pooh is a beloved character. So let's use this guy as our voyage to look at the Miles Morales arc. So first, where is Miles Morales at in this game as a person? Before this, he was a rookie who was making a bunch of mistakes, and when his mentor put the city in his hands, he had to step up and become Spider-Man. And by the end of the game, he is now Spider-Man for the first time. So now Miles has to balance being Spider-Man as well as his real life responsibilities and obligations. And by being Spider-Man, he is tampering the life of Miles Morales. And whenever Miles has to be present in the moment, he looks for an excuse to become Spider-Man to avoid his problems. And even as Spider-Man, Miles still has to deal with challenges to his emotions and maturity. I'll also say that Miles isn't very good in this story either. I saw people saying that he's good in this game, and honestly, I'm wondering if we played the same game. His main conflict is that he suddenly wants revenge on Martin Lee for killing his dad, and it felt very forced. For one, I don't think Miles brought up Lee even once in his own game. But now he's possessed by this dark urge to get revenge. Oh, uh, what? Martin Lee was in the raft during Miles Morales, but the actions of the previous game didn't just disappear into thin air. Why would he be thinking about Lee anyway in the context of Miles Morales? The guy's in jail and he simply has bigger fish to fry in the moment. Lee being around and Miles feeling anger makes complete sense. This is the same guy who killed his father in the first game when he was powerless and after he found comfort through Spider-Man, either it be the literal Spider-Man or Peter Parker or their principles and actions. But now Miles has the ability to do something in direct action for the first time and Lee being around gives Miles a test, which he fails at. Miles holding on to the past and holding on to hate begins to affect his ability as Spider-Man. He almost lets Lee die, he almost gets innocent people killed because he can't let go, both physically and mentally. When you put Spider-Man under a microscope, he's a very simple character. He's gonna do the right thing, get back up no matter what, and do what matters most for the greater good. Um, actually, in Comic Book 1738, Peter is really jaded and badass and has nunchucks and fights in the sewer with- At first, it looks like a textbook Gary Sue, but Spider-Man gets his ass whooped and loses a lot. He gets punished for doing the right thing and often has to take the high road. I think it's kind of a cop-out to have a scene like this where we are just blatantly told whatever the character's feeling inside. And the themes and conflicts that are being explored in these scenes are very bland and surface level. Oh no, Miles doesn't want his friends to leave him. Okay, well they're not gonna. There's no sign of any of this conflict in Miles' daily life. So again, it feels forced. Spider-Man's simplistic core values make my very good role model and mascot for the good guy. So adding insecurity, guilt, and skepticism is really interesting and more importantly, human. I loved how they did it in Far From Home with Mysterio. I loved how they did it in Spider-Verse and here it's good as well. But it wasn't Peter's fault Iron Man died, so it makes no sense. But Miles becoming Spider-Man doesn't necessarily mean that Peter dying is his fault, so it makes no sense. But when did doubt and insecurity have to be literal? Miles is allowed to have anxiety. It makes sense due to how much responsibility he has on his shoulders. And being Spider-Man does have repercussions on his life. Miles' arc is very consistent. He has to deal with personal responsibilities while also dealing with internal conflicts as Spider-Man as well. Peter and Miles are two different dudes in the same story. You could have crazy symbiote stuff and you could save the school and do the little guy things. It's what Miles is supposed to do after all. I'm an enjoyer of Spider-Man Homecoming, and once again we get to experience a kid learning and becoming a hero. His relationship with Peter though could be fixed, and I'll talk about this later. Miles and his plotline is struggling. He's letting his future slip, he's focused on the past and the wrongdoings of Martin Lee, he's constantly abandoning those in his life while worrying them. So of course Miles is insecure and worried, and his mentor is no longer here to guide him, so he has to seek guidance in his mom, as well as his dad. Later, Miles has to help MJ, and once again, he's punished for doing the right thing, and gets a little shot of G Fuel. He's then captured by Craven so that he could fight Martin Lee. Before facing Martin Lee, you could do side objectives that dive deeper into the Miles Morales character arc. When doing the Prowler side missions, Miles is skeptical and he thinks his Uncle Aaron is going to go back to a life of crime, planning a heist on an apartment. Then it's revealed that Miles helping Uncle Aaron take his tech off the streets inspired his mom to also help him, so she co-signed for an apartment so that he can move on from the Prowler. When doing all the mysterious Mysterio missions, it's revealed that the workers for Mysterio use his likeness to their advantage, and he has a discussion with Miles about it. A lot of bad guys in this game are trying to move on from what they used to be, but are now being forced to revert back to their older ways against their will. Flint Marco became Sandman because Craven pulled it out of him. Dr. Connors was 
was forced to become the lizard, Tombstone had a job and was captured, and Black Cat was trying to save her girlfriend, and for Martin Lee, just like Miles, they're both stuck in a cage dancing for someone else's amusement. At first, Miles is full of anger, but fighting through his insecurities and doubts, he discovers what he truly believes in. Miles doesn't need revenge to be satisfied, but rather the opposite. Like Uncle Aaron, Mysterio, Sandman, and all the other villains, Miles believes that people can move past their past if given a second chance. So he lets Lee go and make things right. Impacting Lee, he finds Peter and tells him about Miles. Then later in the game when having to save Peter, he's helped by Lee who reflects the mirror back. Martin Lee hurt others undeserving on his path of revenge. Miles chooses to do the opposite and move past his past and would rather save people and give them a second chance because that's what Spider-Man is about. And by Miles moving on, he saves and reforms the person who hurt him most. And Martin Lee gives his powers to Spider-Man, someone who could use it for the greater good. It's an amazing arc, a mix of T'Challa from Captain America Civil War and Peter from Spider-Man 3. It's a classic Spider-Man story with fun set pieces, obstacles, and progression beats. It's an amazing way to handle this deuteragonist. Miles' sections of the game holds up very well, and pretty much the only weaker parts of him is his dynamic with Peter, which is Peter's fault. Which brings up the elephant in the room. The characters in this game are undeveloped in the story of Peter Parker, including Miles. Peter in the Insomniac world is such a good telling of the Spider-Man story, and to see him not properly fleshed out in this game is really disappointing. It was an easy layup as well. The groundwork is here, but not fleshing it out makes a lot of the moments in this game fall flat, especially the interactions that involve the symbiote. In the start, Peter is in a really good spot for this game's narrative. Peter has given up his life to be Spider-Man, and when he is Spider-Man, he is struggling, but when he's Peter, he isn't and could still make a difference, but he can't fully be Peter because Miles isn't fully confident yet to be the one and only Spider-Man. These are really good foundations, and with these foundations, there's already consequence. By having to be Spider-Man, Peter loses his teaching job that he actually enjoyed. There are obstacles in Peter's life that can be played upon, and you have the golden ticket to exaggerate them with the symbiote in the story. But what Peter suffers from most in this game is being too composed with everything. Peter is too much of a nice guy, so when he acts all mean later in the game, it feels like a forced parody. It's so strange and out of character that it doesn't even feel like Peter, but someone else entirely. But not in a good narrative way like we've seen so many other times before with the symbiote suit. You're not yourself. That suit is changing you. I'm busting this my is the most obnoxious thing you. I've ever experienced in my yet. life. And every other character in this game sees it that way as well. So now Peter has no repercussions for his actions when he's in the suit. Neither does anybody else when they wear the suit. Because now the goo is an entirely different character to the host. It falls flat. Jamie, pull up Spider-Man 3 by Sam Raimi. There's a lot of faults of this movie, trust me, I know, but Peter Parker was not one of them. Even without the symbiote, Sam Raimi had obstacles for Peter in this movie. This Spider-Man was gonna have to deal with ego. Without the symbiote, Peter was on top of the world and everyone loved him, so he was consumed by validation. Peter was so full of ego that he neglected everyone else's feelings around him. So when things got bad and he got the symbiote, I felt like a dude doubling down and playing into his addiction. Every time life got bad, he hid in Spider-Man. And not the normal Spider-Man, but a stronger, faster, more confident Spider-Man. He couldn't function without the suit, and the more he used it, the more he relied on it, and the more it exaggerated his behaviors and changed him. The symbiote enhanced already existing emotions. Peter being an asshole wasn't just because of some alien. The alien combined with his internal conflict, and Peter had to deal with the accountability to his problems. Insomniac Peter Parker feels just too much like a Looney Tunes character, so it has no impact. Spider-Man 3 and Spider-Man 2 are different. This Peter is older and has been through different shit. I'm not gatekeeping that this has to be an ego story, but Peter has to have character flaws in a symbiote story. This is an older Spider-Man that is failing to provide for Mary Jane. He can't pay his mortgage, so she has to work a job she hates to help him. And the reason he can't pay his mortgage is because he can't hold a job, because Spider-Man prevents that. And he has to stay Spider-Man because his prodigy isn't confident to do everything himself yet. And when he's with his prodigy, he's getting his ass whooped while his prodigy is stronger, faster, and younger. Peter does not have it together, and he needs to express this rather than being humble and understanding when conflict happens. Miles has flaws when starting the game, in relations to revenge. It makes him impulsive and a worse Spider-Man. Peter also needs drastic flaws. Even before the symbiote is at play, Peter needs to be insecure, jealous, annoyed, stressed, and lost, but this time without guidance since Aunt May is gone, which sends him down the rabbit hole. Later in this game, it even shows that in Peter's mind, he believes that him being a bad Spider-Man is the reason Aunt May is dead. When Peter gets in a fight with Harry and MJ, the scene doesn't work since this is the first time in the game where he has a verbal conflict with these two characters. The interaction before was MJ doing a monster chase. Even Peter told her to run because he didn't have full control. None of it was genuine. Even in this scene, he's hijacked by goo, so nothing's real. And they both know this. They know that he's hijacked by a goo. So they 
aren't mad at Peter either. Yesterday, he almost killed MJ, but there's no consequence since Pete and the goo are so disconnected. Peter and MJ also just feel so disconnected. When he gets yapped at by symbiote MJ, it also falls flat because Peter has been nothing but passive before the goo and had no conflict before this fight. Even in the fight, MJ and the goo are disconnected. She even breaks character saying that this is not her. So once again, nothing feels real. There's no accountability. Remember your book? You said you want to help people. Nobody read it. <laughs> Nobody cares. That's not true. If I helped one person, it was worth it. Shut the fuck up. It makes it hard to root for MJ because Peter is too nice and her anger is not genuine. You could side with MJ and Spider-Man 3 easily by seeing how her and Peter interact. Everything MJ does is discredited while Spider-Man steals the limelight, and all Peter does is brag about how much everyone loves him while her dreams are dying. MJ is doing so bad that she has to work a side job, all while Peter gets to be Spider-Man. And as Spider-Man, he's kissing other women and being an asshole, so when he gets the symbiote, everything is worse, since there was already problems before. In Spider-Man 2, MJ works a job she hates and has to hold the financial end of Peter, and by doing this, she sidelines her actual passions. But she's also sad because when she wrote about her actual passions, nobody cared. Nobody read it. These are good foundations, but they go nowhere since Pete and MJ are stable and passive, even though everything around them isn't. The ending kiss sucks because nothing gets resolved. They're kissing at Coney Island and they're on great terms before. They're on great terms the whole game. Peter and MJ should not be on good terms. They should both be stressed out. MJ should be annoyed with Pete. Pete should be annoyed with her. Pete should also be annoyed at the stuff holding him down like Miles and Spider-Man. In Spider-Man PS4, MJ and Peter had conflict, which created an arc for their relationship. So that kiss at the end did have weights. In that game, MJ was annoyed with Pete not cooperating with her as Spider-Man. And in this game, she should be annoyed with Spider-Man not cooperating with her as Pete, the opposite of the previous game. It would also add more tension to the relationship of Miles and Peter, since their relationship is taking away from him and MJ's relationship. It's hard to care about Peter and MJ in this game because they are so goddamn perfect and love each other through thick and thin. Peter and MJ should have been rocky. Then Peter spirals and spirals on all the jealousy and insecurity. Everything that was quiet gets amplified when he gets the suit. I'm the hero. You're not you. Hurt feelings, be an asshole, make it very hard to root for Peter. You can have whatever take you want on Spider-Man 3, but when Peter slaps MJ, it steals the room. It really does feel like Pete just hit a rock bottom, and it's not just the symbiote's fault. It's Peter's fault. These same critiques apply to Harry and Miles. Once again, Peter's too much of a nice guy. Also, Miles and Harry never interact aside from a phone call and seeing each other in the open world and a boss fight. Or just like this fight scene, there's no prior conflict so it all falls flat. With Harry Osborn, you have a lot of puzzle pieces for overlap. Insomniac should have tackled FOMO, which for the old head stands for the fear of missing out. Harry struggling with FOMO could have tied Miles to the symbiote Peter plot outside of his own Martin Lee plot. And it also would have tied Harry to the narrative of both Miles and Peter as well, which would have made everybody have great character arcs. Harry has been gone due to the sickness he can't control, to then come back and find out he's replaced by some new dude. Also, a lot of stuff has progressed since he's been gone. It would be pretty natural for Harry to feel like he got left behind. It also tied to how Peter is feeling as Spider-Man, who also feels like he's slipping out of touch to a stronger Miles Morales. This would give Harry more importance when he gets the superpowers from the symbiote. Not only does he have cool superpowers, but he can also now fit in with Peter and Miles. This would also make Peter more insecure, since Peter is now the weak link of the three. And with Harry and Miles, you could develop them as well. Harry could have been jealous of Miles when he had FOMO, but since now he's stronger, he takes Peter away from him out of jealousy, both mentally and physically. He becomes Peter's right-hand man as a superhero, as well as his right-hand man outside of the suit through their foundation. So now normal Peter is doing better with Harry, and Spider-Man is doing better with Harry. Which means Miles is losing a mentor, which annoys him and also makes him jealous. So the more Miles tries to win Peter back, Peter can now be irritated with Miles, since it seems like he's trying to intervene and sabotage his life, which makes the fight later make way more sense than just yapping goo. But none of this happens. There's no triangle of progress. And when it comes to them individually as characters, the way Peter interacts with them sucks. In the start, Peter is not annoyed that he lost his job because of Miles. When Miles messes up on the boat with Martin Lee that shows Peter can't fully trust Miles to be alone yet, he just lets it slide. When they meet at Coney Island, that's Miles' first time meeting Harry. And they aren't even there for the same reason. Miles leaves after. They don't have a plot together. When they chase the lizard, it's on the whim, and Miles has no context of what's been going on. He doesn't even know that Peter almost died. And then they don't meet each other again until their boss fight. When swinging around, Peter in the suit talks about how Miles messes up and pissed him off. But Miles has no idea about these feelings. And once again, Peter never talked about it outside of just goo. The main conflict between Miles and Peter is that he doesn't answer his phone calls. Even Miles says this. You don't even answer my calls anymore, man. This whole boss fight is an awesome set piece and a great concept, but the execution has no weight because it's all bullshit. Miles and Peter do not interact 
interact in the story. Peter never had any problem with Miles. He never hurt Miles' feelings, never showed that he was insecure by Miles. During the Martin Lee fight, we see that Miles fears that he might be letting Peter down, but to give Cosmonaut a bone, Pete actually needed to show frustration or annoyance outside of this black goo shit. It feels like a cop-out. Him and Miles needed to have arguments and conflict. It would have helped both Miles and Peter as characters, so that when Peter gets the symbiote, he feels like a better Spider-Man. He's no longer the weak link of the three. He doesn't need Miles or MJ. He can do everything himself. It creates a solution to an extremely insecure person that feels like he's getting left behind. It would also add weight to these pieces of dialogue in their fights. You're in the way, Miles! Always in the way! Don't try to mentor me! You're the one running away from your problems! You're not better than me! I need this suit! It makes me a better Spider-Man! I'm the hero! I don't get sick! All I wanted was to save everyone! I can't let this go! And finally everything everyone needs me to fake! Frustrates the living shit out of me because it's such a cool idea and the foundations were there, but this scene just doesn't work. It once again feels like two different characters. And when it's over, everything goes back to normal. It's glad to have you back, man. Even in the fight, Miles is being so generic. It's the suit, Pete! Fight the suit, Pete! It's stronger than some suit, Pete! Don't listen to it! I know you don't mean that! The fight is just spectacle with no weight or tension. And then we got Harry. Harry should have had a fear of FOMO when things were good, but this didn't happen. Harry should have been a jealous, spiteful asshole to Miles, which shows that the suit corrupts you. It would have given Miles incentive to defeat Harry, which caused conflict with Peter, but this didn't happen. Harry is a good guy with the goo, he's a good guy after the goo, and only becomes a bad guy when he's literally about to fucking die, and even then, Venom is different from Harry. Harry should have had character flaws with the symbiote, so when he loses it, he becomes antagonistic. Harry no longer having a symbiote means he has to experience FOMO again, but not just emotionally, but now also physically since he's weak and dying. This could tie both Peter and Miles together as well. Since Peter has the suit now, he could be like Harry, stronger, faster, and a better Spider-Man. But also like Harry, he could be egotistical, selfish, and insane. Secure. He could be so flawed that he doesn't give the suit back even though it could save Harry's life, which makes him justifiably angry. It's like the goblin scene in Tazen 2, but not stupid, since this would make sense since it's a dickhead Peter Parker. This would also squash the beef of Miles and Harry, making him annoyed with Peter, saying that his toxicity has made him a bad person to the people he used to care for most, which would add more tension to their fight. This would also make Harry have conflict with both Pete and Miles in a realistic way other than just goo making him crazy. Peter would also have to deal with the consequences of hoarding the goo, Miles now has a reason to exist with development toward Harry rather than this jarring shitty boss fight where two people know nothing about each other, and the story of Harry could be a really sad, tragic retelling of Venom. That he felt a human error rather than a really strong black slime. By the end, Harry should have been fully convinced that he needed Venom, that he could only be something by being Venom, unlike Peter, who at some point overcomes the symbiote and learns a lesson. But in this game, Harry begs for you to kill him and has no control of the goo. Venom takes over, so like before, they're two different characters characters. Venom sucks. He's a one-dimensional bad guy who wants to take over the world, which is frustrating because he's so goddamn cool and fun to play. I wish they tied a reason for him that was more narrative-driven with Harry. You could have had a really cool Venom other than just spectacle. Eddie Brock is a Peter Parker parody. High Top once said it himself, he's Peter Parker if he never had an Uncle Ben. But with all of this, like the title says, Spider-Man 2 isn't a masterpiece, but it's still not a bad game. Even with these mistakes and misses, you have awesome set pieces that are memorable and exciting. Like we got to play as Venom in gameplay and had a boss fight with Kraven. The voice acting in this game is great. Tony Todd as Venom slaps and Yuri Lowenthal deserves that award. We are your son. Spider-Man 2 is a must-play game if you have the PS5. It's not a lazy slop DLC like Modern Warfare 3, which I'll be making a video on, so subscribe if you want to see that. And yeah, stuff could have been better, but nonetheless, I'm still excited for what they do with Wolverine. Once again, I want to give thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring the video. It's a fun vehicle combat game with amazing graphics and immersive gameplay that is free on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation. Play War Thunder. It's free on all platforms. And for new members and those who haven't touched the game for at least six months, you can now claim the large bonus pack by using my link in the description. Thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Quickly, thank you to Mingus, Antrodox, and Degenerate for helping with this video. Uh, subscribe for more. New MW3 videos soon. Goodbye.